Act Four of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One A Room in the Castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. There's matter in these sighs, these profound heaves. You must translate, tis fit we understand them. Where is your son? Bestow this place on us a little while. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Ah, my good lord, what have I seen to-night? What, Gertrude? How does Hamlet? Mad as the sea and wind, when both contend which is the mightier. In his lawless fit, behind the arras, hearing something stir, whips out his rapier, cries, A rat, a rat, and in this brainish apprehension, kills the unseen good old man. Oh, heavy deed! It had been so with us had we been there. His liberty is full of threats to all, to you yourself, to us, to every one. Oh, alas, how shall this bloody deed be answered? It will be laid to us, whose providence should have kept short, restrained, and out of haunt this mad young man. But so much was our love we would not understand what was most fit. But like the owner of a foul disease, to keep it from divulging, let it feed even on the pith of life. Where is he gone? To draw apart the body he hath killed or whom his very madness, like some ore among a mineral of metal's base, shows itself pure. He weeps for what is done. O oh, Gertrude, come away. The sun no sooner shall the mountains touch, but we will ship him hence. And this vile deed we must with all our majesty and skill both countenance and excuse. Ho, Guildenstern! Re-enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Friends both, go join you with some further aid. Hamlet in madness hath Polonius slain, and from his mother's closet hath he dragged him. Go seek him out. Speak fair, and bring the body into the chapel. I pray you, haste in this. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Come, Gertrude, we'll call up our wisest friends, and let them know both what we mean to do and what's untimely done. Oh, come away! My soul is full of discord and dismay. Exeunt. Scene two. Another room in the castle. Enter Hamlet. Safely stowed. Hamlet! Hamlet. Lord Hamlet! Lord Hamlet! What noise? Who calls on Hamlet? Oh, here they come. Enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. What have you done, my lord, with the dead body? Compounded it with dust, whereto tis kin. Tell us where tis, that we may take it thence and bear it to the chapel. Do not believe it. Believe what? That I can keep your counsel and not mine own. Besides, to be demanded of a sponge, what replication should be made by the son of a king? Take you me for a sponge, my lord? I, sir, that soaks up the king's countenance, his rewards, his authorities. But such officers do the king best service in the end. He keeps them like an ape in the corner of his jaw, first mouthed to be last swallowed. When he needs what you have gleaned, it is but squeezing you, and sponge, you shall be dry again. I understand you not, my lord. I am glad of it. A knavish speech sleeps in a foolish ear. My lord, you must tell us where the body is, and go with us to the king. The body is with the king, but the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. A thing, my lord. Of nothing. Bring me to him. Hide fox and all after. Exeunt. Scene three. Another room in the castle. Enter King Claudius, attended. I have sent to seek him and to find the body. How dangerous is it that this man goes loose! Yet must not we put the strong law on him? He's loved of the distracted multitude, who like not in their judgment but their eyes. And where tis so, the offender's scourge is weighed, but never the offence. To bear all smooth and even, this sudden sending him away must seem deliberate pause. Diseases desperate grown by desperate appliance are relieved, or not at all. 
Enter Rosencrantz. How now? What hath befallen? Where the dead body is bestowed, my lord, we cannot get from him. But where is he? Without, my lord, guarded to know your pleasure. Bring him before us. Ho, Guildenstern, bring in my lord. Enter Hamlet and Guildenstern. Now, Hamlet, where's Polonius? At supper. At supper. Where? Not where he eats, but where he is eaten. A certain convocation of politic worms are e'en at him. Your worm is your only emperor for diet. We fat all creatures else to fat us, and we fat ourselves for maggots. Your fat king and your lean beggar is but variable service. Two dishes but to one table. That's the end. <sighs> alas, alas! A man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king, and cat of the fish that hath fed of that worm. What dost you mean by this? Nothing, but to show you how a king may go a progress through the guts of a beggar. Where is Polonius? In heaven. Send hither to see. If your messenger find him not there, seek him in the other place yourself. But, indeed, if you find him not within this month, you shall nose him as you go up the stairs into the lobby. Go seek him there. He will stay till you come. Exeunt attendants. Hamlet, this deed, for thine especial safety, which we do tender as we dearly grieve for that which thou hast done, must send thee hence with fiery quickness. Therefore prepare thyself. The bark is ready, and the wind at help. The associates tend, and everything is bent for England. For England? Aye, Hamlet. Good. So is it, if thou knewest our purposes. I see a cherub that sees them. But come for England. Farewell, dear mother. Thy loving father, Hamlet. My mother. Father and mother is man and wife, man and wife is one flesh, and so my mother. Come, for England. Exit. Follow him at foot. Tempt him with speed aboard. Delay it not. I'll have him hence to-night. Away! For everything is sealed and done that else leans on the affair. Pray you make haste. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And England, if my love thou holdst at aught, as my great power thereof may give thee sense, since yet thy cicatrice looks raw and red after the Danish sword, and thy free awe pays homage to us, thou mayst not coldly set our sovereign process, which imports at full by letters congruing to that effect the present death of Hamlet. Do it, England, for like the hectic in my blood he rages, and thou must cure me. Till I know tis done, howe'er my haps my joys were ne'er begun. Exit. Scene four. A plain in Denmark. Enter Fortinbras, a captain, and soldiers marching. Go, captain, from me greet the Danish king. Tell him that, by his license, Fortinbras craves the conveyance of a promised march over his kingdom. You know the rendezvous. If that his majesty would aught with us, we shall express our duty in his eye. And let him know so. I will do it, my lord. Go softly on. Exeunt Fortinbras and soldiers. Enter Hamlet, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and others. Good sir, whose powers are these? They are of Norway, sir. How purposed, sir, I pray you? Against some part of Poland. Who commands them, sir? The nephews to old Norway, Fortinbras. Goes it against the main of Poland, sir, or for some frontier? Truly to speak, and with no addition, we go to gain a little patch of ground that hath in it no profit but the name. To pay five ducats, five, I would not farm it. Nor will it yield to Norway or the Pole a rancor raid, should it be sold in fee. Why, then the Polak never will defend it. Yes, it is already garrisoned. Two thousand souls and twenty thousand ducats will not debate the question of this straw. This is the imposthume of much wealth and peace, that inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies. I humbly thank you, sir. God be with you, sir. 
Exit. Wilt please you go, my lord? I'll be with you straight. Go a little before. Exeunt all except Hamlet. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. What is a man if his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed? A beast no more. Sure he that made us with such large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fust in us unused. Now whether it be bestial oblivion, or some craven scruple, of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which, quartered, hath but one part wisdom and ever three parts coward, I do not know why yet I live to say this thing's to do, sith I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. Examples gross as earth exhort me. Witness this army of such mass and charge, led by a delicate and tender prince, whose spirit, with divine ambition puffed, makes mouths at the invisible event, exposing what is mortal and unsure to all that fortune, death, and danger dare, even for an eggshell. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honour is at the stake. How stand I, then, that have a father killed, a mother stained, excitements of my reason and my blood, and let all sleep? While to my shame I see the imminent death of twenty thousand men, that for a fantasy and trick of fame go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try the cause, which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody, or be nothing worth. Exit. Scene five, Elsinore, a room in the castle. Enter Queen Gertrude, Horatio, and a gentleman. I will not speak with her. She is importunate, indeed distract. Her mood will needs be pitied. What would she have? She speaks much of her father, says she hears there's tricks i' the world, and hems and beats her heart, spurns enviously at straws, speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense. Her speech is nothing, yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. They aim at it, and botch the words up fit to their own thought which as her winks and nods and gestures yield them indeed would make one think there might be sought though nothing sure yet much unhappily twere good she were spoken with for she may strew dangerous conjectures in ill-breeding minds let her come in exit horatio to my sick soul as sin's true nature is each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. So full of artless jealousy is guilt, it spills itself in fearing to be spilt. Re-enter Horatio with Ophelia. Where is the beauteous majesty of Denmark? How now, Ophelia? How should I your true love know from another one? By his cockle hat and staff and his sandal shoon. Alas, sweet lady, what imports this song? Say you? Nay, pray you, mark. He is dead and gone, lady, he is dead and gone. At his hat a grass-green turf, at his heels a stone. Nay, but Ophelia. Pray you, mark white his shroud as the mountain snow enter king claudius alas look here my lord lauded with sweet flowers which be wept to the grave did go with true love showered how do you pretty lady well god yield you they say the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. 
God be at your table. Conceit upon her father. Pray you, let's have no words of this, but when they ask you what it means, say you this. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning be time. And I am made at your window to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes and up the chamber door. Let in the maid that out a maid never departed more. Pretty Ophelia. Indeed. Law, without an oath, I'll make an end on it. By kiss and by same charity, alack and fie for shame. Young men will do it if they come to it, my cock they are to blame. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. So would I had done by under sun, And thou hadst not come to my bed. How long hath she been thus? I hope all will be well. We must be patient. But I cannot choose but weep, To think they should lay him in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it. And so I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Exit. Follow her close. Give her good watch, I pray you. Exit Horatio. Oh, this is the poison of deep grief. It springs all from her father's death. Oh, Gertrude. Gertrude, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. First her father slain, next your son gone, and he most violent author of his own just remove. The people muddied, thick and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers for good Polonius's death. And we have done but greenly in hugger-mugger to inter him. Poor Ophelia divided from herself and her fair judgment without the which we are pictures or mere beasts. Last, and as much containing as all these, her brother is in secret come from France, feeds on his wonder, keeps himself in clouds, and wants not buzzers to infect his ear with pestilent speeches of his father's death, wherein necessity of matter beggared will nothing stick our person to arraign in ear and ear. Oh, my dear Gertrude, this, like to a murdering piece, in many places gives me superfluous death. A noise within. Alack, what noise is this? Where are my Switzers? Let them guard the door. Enter another gentleman. What is the matter? Save yourself, my lord. The ocean, overpairing of his list, eats not the flaps with more impetuous haste than young Laertes in a riotous head or bears your officers the rabble call him lord and as the world were now but to begin antiquity forgot custom not known the ratifiers and props of every word they cry choose we laertes shall be king caps hands and tongues applaud it to the clouds laertes shall be king laertes king how cheerfully on the false trail they cry. Oh, this is counter. You false Danish dogs. The doors are broke. Noise within. Enter Laertes, armed, Danes following. Where is this king? Sirs, stand you all without. No, no let's, let's, come, let's in. come in. I pray you, give me leave. We, we will. will. We will. We will. We will. They retire without the door. I thank you. Keep the door. O thou vile king, give me my father. Calmly, good Laertes. That drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard. Cries cuckold to my father, brands a harlot even here, between the chaste unsmirched brow of my true mother. What is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? 
Let him go, Gertrude, do not fear our person. Though such divinity doth hedge a king, that treason can but peep to what it would, acts little of his will. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed. Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man. Where is my father? Dead. But not by him. Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. To hell allegiance, bows to the blackest devil, conscience and grace to the profoundest pit, I dare damnation. To this point I stand, that both the worlds I give to negligence, let come what comes, only I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. Who shall stay you? My will, not all the world. And for my means I'll husband them so well, they shall go far with little. Good Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your dear father's death, is't writ in your revenge, that swoopstake you will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser? None but his enemies. Will you know them, then? To his good friends thus wild I'll ope my arms, and like the kind life-rendering pelican, repass them with my blood. Why, now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman that I am guiltless of your father's death, and am most sensible in grief for it, it shall as level to your judgment pierce as day does to your eye. Let, Let her come, come, in. come in. Oh, now, what noise is that? Re-enter Ophelia. Oh, heat, dry up my brains, tears seven times salt, burn out the sense and virtue of mine eye. By heaven thy madness shall be paid by weight, till our scale turn the beam, O rose of May. Dear maid, kind sister, sweet Ophelia, O oh, heavens, is possible a young maid's wits should be as moral as an old man's life? Nature is fine in love, and where tis fine, it sends some precious instance of itself after the thing it loves. They bore him barefaced on the bier, hey non nonny nonny, hey nonny. And in his grave rained many a tear. Fare you well, my dove. Hadst thou thy wits, and didst persuade revenge, it could not move thus. You must sing a down, a down, and you call him a down. -a oh, how the wheel becomes it. It is the false steward that stole his master's daughter. This nothing's more than matter. There's rosemary, that's for remembrance. Pray, love, remember. And then there's pansies, that's for thoughts. A document in madness, thoughts and remembrance fitted. There's fennel for you, and columbines. There's rue for you, and here's some for me. We may call it herb grace of Sundays. Oh, you must weigh your rue with a difference. There's a daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. For Bonnie, sweet Robin, is all my joy. Thought and affliction, passion, hell itself, she turns to favor and to prettiness. And will he not come again? And will he not come? Exit. Do you see this, O oh God? Laertes, I must commune with your grief, or you deny me right. Go but apart, make choice of whom your wisest friends you will. 
and they shall hear and judge twixt you and me. If by direct or by collateral hand they find us touched, we will our kingdom give, our crown, our life, and all that we can ours, to you in satisfaction. But if not, be you content to lend your patience to us, and we shall jointly labour with your soul to give it due content. Let this be so. His means of death, his obscure funeral, no trophy swore nor hatchment o'er his bones, no noble rite nor formal ostentation, cry to be heard as twere from heaven to earth, that I must call it in question. So you shall, and where the offence is, let the great axe fall. I pray you, go with me. Exeunt. Scene six. Another room in the castle. Enter Horatio and a servant. What are they that would speak with me? Sailors, sir. They say they have letters for you. Let them come in. Exit, servant. I do not know from what part of the world I should be greeted, if not from Lord Hamlet. Enter sailors. God bless you, sir. Let him bless thee, too. He shall, sir, and please him. There's a letter for you, sir. It comes from the ambassador that was bound for England. If your name be Horatio, as I am let to know it is. Reads. Horatio. When thou shalt have overlooked this, give these fellows some means to the king. They have letters for him. Ere we were two days old at sea, a pirate of very warlike appointment gave us chase. Finding ourselves too slow of sail, we put on a compelled valor, and in the grapple I boarded them, on the instant they got clear of our ship, so I alone became their prisoner. They have dealt with me like thieves of mercy, but they knew what they did. I am to do a good turn for them. Let the king have the letters I have sent, and repair thou to me with as much speed as thou wouldest fly death. I have words to speak in thine ear will make thee dumb, yet are they much too light for the bore of the matter. These good fellows will bring thee where I am. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern hold their course for England. Of them I have much to tell thee. Farewell. He that knowest thine, Hamlet. Come, I will make you way for these your letters, and do it the speedier, that you may direct me to him from whom you brought them. Exeunt. Scene 7. Another room in the castle. Enter King Claudius and Laertes. Now must your conscience my acquaintance seal, and you must put me in your heart for friend. Sith you have heard, and with a knowing ear, that he which hath your noble father slain pursued my life. It well appears, but tell me why you proceeded not against these feats, so crimeful and so capital in nature, as by your safety, wisdom, all things else, you mainly were stirred up. Oh, for two special reasons, which may to you perhaps seem much unsinewed but yet to me they are strong. The queen his mother lives almost by his looks. And for myself, my virtue or my plague, be it either which, she's so conjunctive to my life and soul, that as the star moves not but in his sphere, I could not but by her. The other motive, why to a public count I might not go, is the great love the general gender bear him who, dipping all his faults in their affection, would, like the spring that turneth wood to stone, convert his jives to graces, so that my arrows, too slightly timbered for so loud a wind, would have reverted to my bow again, and not where I had aimed them. And so have I a noble father lost, a sister driven into desperate terms, whose worth, if praises may go back again, should challenge her on mount of all the age for her perfections. But my revenge will come! Break not your sleeps for that. You must not think that we are made of stuff so flat and dull that we can let our beard be shook with danger and think it pastime. You shortly shall hear more. I loved your father, and we love ourself, and that, I hope, will teach you to imagine— Enter a messenger. How now? What news? Letters, my lord, from Hamlet. This to your majesty, this to the queen. From Hamlet? Who brought them? Sailors, my lord, they say. I saw them not. They were given me by Claudio. He received them of him that brought them. Laertes, you shall hear them. Leave us. Exit messenger. Reads. 
high and mighty, you shall know I am set naked on your kingdom. To-morrow shall I beg leave to see your kingly eyes. When I shall, first asking your pardon thereunto, recount the occasion of my sudden and more strange return. Hamlet. What should this mean? Are all the rest come back? Or is it some abuse and no such thing? Know you the hand? Tis Hamlet's character. Naked? And in a postscript here he says alone. Can you advise me? I'm lost in it, my lord, but let him come. It warms a very sickness in my heart that I shall live and tell him to his teeth. Thus didst thou. If it be so, Laertes, as how should it be so, how otherwise? Will you be ruled by me? Ay, my lord, so you will not or rule me to a peace. To thine own peace. If he be now returned, as checking at his voyage, and that he means no more to undertake it, I will work him to an exploit, now ripe in my device, under the which he shall not choose but fall. And for his death no wind of blame shall breathe, but even his mother shall uncharge the practice, and call it accident. My lord, I will be ruled, the rather if you could devise it so, that I might be the organ. It falls right. You have been talked of since your travel much, and that in Hamlet's hearing, for a quality wherein they say you shine. Your sum of parts did not together pluck such envy from him as did that one, and that in my regard of the unworthiest siege. What part is that, my lord? A very ribbon in the cap of youth, yet needful too, for youth no less becomes the light and careless livery that it wears than settled age his sables and his weeds importing health and graveness. Two months since, here was a gentleman of Normandy. I've seen myself and served against the French, and they can well on horseback. But this gallant had witchcraft in it. He grew under his seat, and to such wondrous doing brought his horse as he had been encorpsed and demi-natured with the brave beast. So far he topped my thought, that I, in forgery of shapes and tricks, come short of what he did. A Norman wast? A Norman. Upon my life, Le Monde. The very same. I know him well. He is the brute indeed, and gem of all the nation. He made confession of you, and gave you such a masterly report for art and exercise in your defence, and for your rapier most especially that he cried out, "'Twould be a sight indeed if one could match you. The scrimers of their nation, he swore, had had neither motion, guard, nor I, if you opposed them. So this report of his did Hamlet so envenom with his envy that he could nothing do but wish and beg your sudden coming o'er to play with him. Now out of this— What out of this, my lord? Laertes, was your father dear to you? Or are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Why ask you this? Not that I think you did not love your father, but that I know love is begun by time, and that I see in passages of proof time qualifies the spark and fire of it. There lives within the very flame of love a kind of wick or snuff that will abate it, and nothing is at a like goodness still. For goodness, growing to a pleurisy, dies in his own too much. That we would do, we should do when we would. For this would changes, and hath abatements and delays as many as there are tongues, our hands, our accidents. And then this should is like a spendthrift sigh that hurts by easing. But to the quick of the ulcer, Hamlet comes back. What would you undertake to show yourself your father's son in deed more than in words? To cut his throat of the church. No place indeed should murder sanctuarize. Revenge should have no bounds. But, good Laertes, will you do this? Keep close within your chamber. Hamlet return shall know you are come home. We'll put on those shall praise your excellence, and set a double varnish on the fame the Frenchman gave you. Bring in fine together, and wager on your heads. He, being remiss, most generous and free from all contriving, will not peruse the foils. 
so that, with ease, or a little shuffling, you may choose a sword unbated, and in a pass of practice requite him for your father. I will do it, and for that purpose I'll anoint my sword. I bought an unction of a mountebank, so mortal that, but dip a knife in it, where it draws blood no cataplasm so rare, collected from all simples that have virtue under the moon, can save the thing from death, that is, but scratched withal. I'll touch my point with this contagion, that, if I gall him slightly, it may be death. Let's further think of this. Weigh what convenience both of time and means may fit us to our shape. If this should fail, and that our drift look through our bad performance, twere better not essayed. Therefore this project should have a back or second that might hold if this should blast in proof. Soft, let me see. We'll make a solemn wager on your cunnings. I hat. When in your motion you are hot and dry, as make your bouts more violent to that end, and that he calls for drink, I'll have prepared him a chalice for the nonce, whereon but sipping, if he by chance escape your venomed stock, our purpose may hold there. Enter Queen Gertrude. How now, sweet queen? One woe doth tread upon another's heel. So fast they follow. Your sister's drowned, Laertes. Drowned? Oh, where? There is a willow grows aslant a brook, that shows his whole leaves in the glassy stream. There, with fantastic garlands, did she come, of crow-flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples, that liberal shepherds give a grosser name, but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There on the pendant boughs, her coronet weeds, clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke, when down her weedy trophies and herself fell in the weeping brook. Her clothes spread wide, and mermaid-like, a while they bore her up, which time she chanted snatches of old tunes, as one incapable of her own distress, or like a creature, native, and endued unto that element. But long it could not be, till that her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death. Alas, then she is drowned. Drowned, drowned. Too much of water hast thou poor Ophelia, and therefore I forbid my tears. But yet it is our trick, nature her custom holds. Let shame say what it will when these are gone, the woman will be out. Adieu, my lord, I have a speech of fire that fain would blaze, but that this folly doubts it. Exit. Oh, let's follow, Gertrude. How much I had to do to calm his rage! Now fear I this will give it start again. Therefore let's follow. Exeunt. End of Act Four.